questions, let's see if we're live. If you have any questions during the lecture, uh, don't hesitate. Um, but I'm going to try to not rush through, but I have, like last time, I have practice stuff and application stuff. As we do these, it should be cleaner and cleaner to get started with the concepts. Okay. Question? Okay. Um, just making sure. Guys, this is our first circle that is a um, an appendage. So we got two rights and two lefts. So we've done one. You only got one neck. You have a right side of the neck, a left side of the neck. You got one trunk. You got a right side, your left side. So this is the first time where we're going to have a literal right side and a side of a side, if you remember from 310, is medial and lateral. That's what a side of a side means, because the right of a right is different structures than the right of a left. The right of a right is your outside and the right of your left is the inside. So you have this mirror effect of lateral and medial but it really just means the side of a side in that mirror effect. Say, so your circles are all going to be right-sided cross-sectional anatomies because most of us are right-handed. However, the muscles you have on your right side are the exact same as the muscles you have on your left side. And remember, this is all for function. So just because we have an exercise on the left side, everything's still the same. What are my agonists? What am I stretching? What am I using? And then once you identify that, even if on the left side, you can still refer to your right sided circle to identify those muscles because it's the same. They're the same muscles. So we don't have to memorize two circles. What you got to do is just do one because the functions of the muscles are the same. Cool? Okay. Here are the muscles you're going to be responsible for. Bang! Put them out there and their functions and their functions and then I put them into the circles of our cross-sectional anatomy learners remember the cross-sectional anatomy is just a tool that you can use to see function to see pull based on how they cross the joints and I even put a little shortcut the bilateral axis here is your ankle plantar and dorsi flexion. The anterior muscles of the ankle are going to pull in the direction of dorsi flexion. When we were in elementary school, you would do that by pulling on the shoestring of your friend when you wanted to mess with them, and you'd pull on that shoestring and loosen it up so they had to redo their, their, their shoestrings. That's a dorsi flexion puller because you're pulling on the foot in the front. Plantar flexion pullers are going to pull in the back. That would be like if... Um, you were trying to get your shoe on, you may grab the heel in the back and pull this way. So plantar flexors are gonna be in the back, dorsi flexors are gonna be in the front. It's gonna make a lot of sense while we need a lot of horses back here, because that's what's gonna propel our weight, our mass. Don't need as much in the front. Need some, but we don't need as much. This is what's gonna get us around. The AP axis represents our subtalar and transverse torsal joints. That's the inversion and the eversion pullers. In 310, I like to use an inverted skateboard analogy for these. Your ankle are the wheels and the subtalar is the wobble to help you balance. Okay. So our medial crossing muscles, those are going to be our inversion pullers. And our lateral crossing muscles are going to be our eversion pullers. This is the first time where you're going to have two muscles that sit the fence on one of our axes. Easy to understand. Sit the fence is a cliche term that says I can't make up my mind. I'm neither on one side or the other. When I ask my wife, where do you want to go eat? She sits the fence. Okay. These two muscles, you've probably heard of them, or at least one of them, your gastrocnemius, your big calf muscle, and the one that's deep to the superficial gastroc, your soleus, they insert on the, on the calcaneus 
but they cross, they literally sit the anterior posterior axis. They are medial, they are neither medial pullers nor lateral pullers in anatomical position. All they do is cross behind. All they do is cross posterior. Does that make sense? In other words, all they have is an ankle function, not a subtalar joint function. That would be like the middle of class. If this row happened to be right in the middle, you neither sit on the left side or the right side. Okay. Dors when we need our dorsi flexors, this front part should light up in your head. When we need our plantar flexors, this posterior part should light up. Everters, inverters. So these muscles are going to have two functions because they sit anteromedial. You might have heard that word in a clinic. Posterolateral. Posteromedial, anterolateral. That's all it means. It's just two directions. So these are going to be our dorsi flexor inverters, our dorsi flexor everters, our plantar flexor everters, our plantar flexor inverters, dorsi flexion inverters, and these two are just going to be plantar flexors. Make sense? So in the other circles, there was a right and left, and I see that this says right ankle, but we're not breaking that up into right or left because this could either be a right ankle or a left ankle. This can only be a right ankle. Okay. The reason we're not doing two circles is because everything you have on this right is the mirror of everything you have on the left. They all do the same thing. So your right tibialis anterior is going to be a dorsi flexor inverter, just like your left tibialis anterior. But if we actually drew another circle, your tibialis anterior would still be anteromedial, but it would it would mess with you when you're trying to remember function because they're mirrors of each other. Okay. So as we're going to see on some practice, when we do left-sided stuff, you still don't go straight to your circles. What's my agonist? Who am I stretching? Da 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 da. Identify the group and then light up the right side because it's the same muscles. Side of a side is medial lateral. Lateral side, <coughs> medial side. That's how we get a side of a side. Good question. You have one muscle that's super unique in the ankle, and that's the gastroc. I'm going to get to it when I, but I want to give you a heads up. The gastroc nebius is biaxial, and technically all of these that have function at the ankle and subtalar biarticular because they're two separate joints, but they live in the same house. They live in the same capsule. They live in the same apartment complex. The gastroc functions at your ankle and that dude functions at a whole nother, <laughs> whole nother place at the knee. I'm going to explain how that's useful. I'm going to explain how we can isolate and emphasize certain muscles based off of length <coughs> tension development of it. It's going to be cool, but that's going to be for us. Look what I did for you. I tried to do a visual of how we get our circle for our ankle and subtape. Your ankle is somewhat circular. You can't see it like this. So I put it up on the board. This is if my foot was up on the screen. There's your ankle joint. There's your wobble. I put it in the middle so we have more space. <laughs> That's all it is. Make sense so far? Okay, so here's a reminder. There's your ankle and subtalar and the muscles. Does everybody have a, a blank space after that? Yeah, you have to do that. So to your question earlier, Olivia, look at this first picture I put, how it's a mirror of each other. So they're both, those two muscles are both lateral, but if you if you looked at them globally, you would you would you wouldn't see that. Okay. 
So the same pull that this muscle has is going to be the exact same pull of motion as that muscle has. In addition, I wanted to show you guys or re-emphasize the importance of how muscles cross versus their origin and insertion, even though I'm going to have those up on the slides. Here's an example of the peroneus longus of a muscle that starts laterally on the outside, crosses your ankle and subtalar, wraps around your foot, and actually inserts on the inside underneath your foot but yet it pulls laterally, even though it's inserting medial, because it's all about how it crosses the joint. That muscle could do a loop-de-loop. -loop. It doesn't matter. It's how does it cross that's going to determine its function. So I, I use that as another example of why the origins and the insertions have no bearing on function on pull. Some of you guys, when you go to grad school, origin starts to be very important, especially for palpating things and you want to, but, but a majority of our, our, I'd say all of our undergraduate students, it's more important to know what muscles do for the different areas you guys are going to do. What do they do? How do they pull? Here's an example of how muscles really are inside the body. So when we go over every muscle independently, everything else is going to be extracted except the muscle we're looking at. So I just wanted to give you a visual of kind of how all these things are kind of running down their channels and their pipelines. So you said it pulled medially or laterally? Laterally, but I'm going to go over that muscle. I just want to give you an example of why origin and insertion doesn't matter to function. It's how do they cross. Yeah, we're going to, we're going to go over that muscle specifically. One of the things I want to show you with this slide is that muscles can grow out at what I call the country. But inside the city, inside the joint capsule itself, that's big city living, meaning nerves, vessels, and we have so much motion, you don't want to have a lot of meaty muscles inside there. It's going to limit your motion, right? So the way we have our cake and eat it too is, we let these muscles grow out in the country where there's no motion out here. When I say no motion, no joint motion, right? And then we convert that pull into these strings we call tendons. And those tendons go through those joints and they take up nowhere near the amount of space as those muscles would. Does that make sense? So that's why, like, we could have our chest, our quads, our hand, they can grow out in the country, but they're going to be converted into strings or tendons that can transfer that force into the city. That's why you're going to see a lot of strings when we get into the, the pulling forces. All right. <clears throat> Tibialis, anterior. A muscle on the tibia that's in the front. Okay. Tibialis anterior. Here's a good example, though, of a muscle that may not demonstrate its function based off of its, especially its origin. So the origin is on the lateral side of your shin, right? It's in the front, but it's on the lateral. Now notice what happens. We cross over into the medial side of our ankle. Because it crosses medially, when that muscle pulls, it's going to be an inversion puller based on how it crosses the sub, um, the sub tailor joint. Or think of it like this. If that's messing with you, imagine that this is skateboard, all right? So this is our foot, inversion, eversion, the balance. It doesn't matter that the muscle starts laterally. If it crosses and pulls medially, wouldn't it want to tilt the skateboard like this? It doesn't matter that it's coming from the outside. It's how does it cross? Does that make sense? Okay. So what I did is I did this very sophisticated, expensive experiment with this plate. The tibialis anterior comes lateral to medial, 
And so when it pulls, it's going to be an inversion puller of the subtalar joint. The anterior pull is pretty obvious. Dorsi flexion puller at the ankle, inversion puller at the subtalar. And how we would see that based off of how it crosses on our circle is exactly this. How does the tibialis anterior function? How does it pull? It crosses anteromedial. It's a dorsi flexion puller and an inversion puller. Does that make sense? So if we would want to stretch it, we'd want to evert, and we'd want to plantar flex, right? Here's another view of our tibialis anterior. So what you're going to notice, I actually did this for you guys here. I showed you how our subtalar AP axis actually falls in between these first two toes. I mean, there's a reason toe off is a single toe because your big toe is when you toe off, it's not toes off. So the wobble for your teeter-totter actually happens in between here. So there's that tibialis anterior crossing anteromedial. Cannot wait to get back to our other class. All right. Extensor hallucis longus, some people refer to it as hallucis. Guys, hallux is just Latin and a lot of Latin words for your big toe. That's all it is. It's the little piggy that went to market. It's your big toe. Pallux is going to be your thumb. Pallux is your toe. So, I didn't mean for that to rhyme. You have a muscle, this is really cool, that starts off in the country that crosses your ankle to get to the big toe. So therefore, it's going to function at the ankle because it crosses the ankle. In fact, if you're wearing tennis shoes, when you're walking and you feel your toes pushing against your webbing of your foot, that's your toes serving as dorsiflexion pullers by pushing on your toe box. Think of it, guys. If I had, if this was just a string on a skeleton and I took this string and yanked this way, sure, it would extend my big toe, but it would also <laughs> want a dorsi flex, pull in the direction of dorsi flex. If the muscle started here and just went to my big toe, then it wouldn't work at the ankle. Does that make sense? But the fact that it crosses the ankle anteromedially, this is going to be our line of demarcation for our AP axis anteromedially that means it's a dorsi flexor and an invert any questions about the extensor big toe longus longus and brevis guys is actually reference to the tendon not the muscle we see that better when we, we there's these uh, sister muscles called the perineals longus and brevis so a longus muscle actually has a shorter muscle belly, but a longer tendon. So when you hear a longus, it's about the tendon. Length. All right, you have some extensor digits, the piggies that stayed home, ate some pastrami, some other stuff. The other piggies. Guys, think of it like this. Unlike your hands that have a lot of dexterity, you have individual muscles for darn near every one of them, except there's, there's a trick you can do to show how your ring finger kind of works with the others. Your toes don't have that. Your toes don't have the dexterity that your hands have. So it makes sense. The big toe kind of needs its own because it's a big, powerful, you know, kind of uh, digit, that first digit. But those two through five, you kind of have one muscle that kind of pulls them all together. So you can see how it fans out. You kind of get here, turns into a string. That string crosses the ankle in the front. 
then it flares out into these individual strings that go off into the toes. So digitorum is almost just kind of like a community of digits, two through five. And if you pull on that one string, these four can <laughs> do this. You ever try to just move an individual toe? Not easy. It's hard enough just to move your big toe. So you have one muscle, passes the ankle, goes to the other toes, pulls in a direction of extension. Extension of the toes, but dorsiflexion pulling of the ankle. Does that make sense? Because it crosses the ankle in the front. Our AP axis is in between our first and second toe. So all of these digits are actually eversion pullers. All of these digits, two through five, are eversion pullers on the right side, flaring your foot out. Do a little experiment. If you do active eversion, notice how your toes kind of flare out a little bit. That's what that is. These are some little intrinsic muscles that don't cross the ankle. So, stensor digitorum. All right, now we get to the family of perineals. Uh, perineal is just another name for a fibularis. So we had the tibialis. Some people refer to it as fibularis. Some people refer to it cat as a minu. Talking about the, the same thing. Um, lateral collateral ligament or fibula collateral ligament. It's the same ligament. It's just what do we want to call it? I like to refer to it as the perineals because that's what you're going to hear a lot in the clinic, the perineals. So you have a family of perineals. <clears throat> Anytime you have muscles that are related to each other, sometimes I'll refer to them as sister muscles because that's how it was taught to me. Sister muscles are going to have the same function. In independent muscles, but have the same function. Cousin muscles have something in common. They have a common relative, but they have other relatives that so they're, they're going to have a similar function, but then they're going to have something opposite. Okay? So the peroneus tertius or tertius, some people refer to it as. You tell me, there is my bilateral axis. Does it cross the ankle in the front or the back? In the front, anterior, right? So wouldn't it be a dorsiflexor, dorsiflexion puller? This is a lateral view whether it's the right foot or the left foot. That's why I love this slide. It's a lateral view. So because it's crossing lateral, it would be an eversion puller. So a dorsiflexor everter. So the peroneus tertius and the extensor digitum would be sister muscles. They have the same functions. Dorsiflexion everters. Dorsiflexor everters. Here's the other part of the family, pronator, I mean, a peroneus longus and peroneus brevis. So remember what I said about longus and brevis are tendon lengths. So look at this longus, how it converts early and a big, long tendon to go into the city. Whereas the brevis, Look how that muscle continues further down and it doesn't turn into a tendon until later. So it's tendon length is shorter. And that's what longness and brevis means, long or short. Okay. Who cares about that? Let's get to function, right? So the peroneus longus and brevis have the same function as the peroneus tertius at the subtalar joint. So all of them are lateral crossing in terms of wobble. However, the longus and brevis cross behind the ankle joint. They're posterior to the ankle joint. So they're going to be plantar flexion pullers, whereas the tertius is going to be a dorsiflexion puller. 
And guys, look, I, I keep saying it, but that's why origin insertion, the function doesn't matter. Here's a muscle that inserts more in the front of the ankle. But it's not a dorsi flexor because it crosses the ankle behind to get there. It crosses posteriorly. That's why it pulls posteriorly. Does that make sense? Someone could see this insertion and be like, oh, that insertion is in the front. It doesn't matter. It, to get to the front, it's got to cross the back. Okay. So let's look at this longus and brevis again. Okay. Peroneus longus, long tendon, crossing in the back. And maybe some of you had the, the, the question, well, how do you get those strings to stay there? Well, our body has a natural tacking system. You have the fancy words, retinaculums. And so we kind of tack these things down there to try to keep them in place as we move around. Longus, there's a good view of it crossing behind the bilateral axis and lateral, posterior lateral, and brevis posterior lateral. The brevis inserts on this metatarsal, that outside foot bone. Sometimes when um, I did a fellowship with youth athletes and when they sprain their ankle, um, that's one of the things we look for is um, the bones haven't fused yet. So the bones are actually still relatively weak than the things yanking on them. And sometimes they'll have avulsion fractures where they'll sprain that or they'll roll that subtalar joint and those ligaments are still very pliable, but those bones haven't fused yet. So that muscle may yank off a little chunk of that bone right there. We call that Jones, Jones fracture. So they're, they're both uh, Let's take a look at experters. Yep. Yeah. Longus and brevis, they're going to be plantar flexor everters. everters yeah. 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 So our dorsi flexors are going to be tibialis anterior, extensa hallucis, extensa digitorum, pronius tertius. Our everters are going to be extensa digitorum, pronius tertius, pronius longus, pronius brevis. Yeah. And, and we're just going to keep going around the circle. Right? And I mentioned. You know, in, in open chain, you know, said, but where they really come in handy is for our balance, using those inverter and everters to balance. Think about it. When you're trying to balance, you don't need gigantic yanks. You need subtle pulls, right? So that kind of makes sense, too, why our big plantar flexion pullers need to kind of be on the axis because one yank, right? We kind of need more fine tuning inverters and everters, and that those big powerful muscles just propel us forward. All right, now we're going to go to our posteromedial medial quadrant. So these are going to be plantar flexors and inverters. A common trick, let me see if I have this trick. Let me see if I have it. Nope, got the trick. A common trick for this quadrant is Tom, Dick, and Harry. Or some people say Tom, Dick, and a nervous Harry. Tom is for tibialis posterior. We already had a tibialis anterior. Dick is for flexor digitorum, and we had extensor digitorum. Makes sense. If we have some extensor on the toes, we got to have some flexor on the toes. And if we had an extensor of our big toe, it makes sense we got a flexor of the big toe. So they're all mirroring each other. So Tom, Dick, a nervous is artery and nerve. So like in terms of how they compartmentalize in that little sheet, and maybe a tricky learning therapy school. Tom, Dick, and Harry. Now guys, this quadrant is extra special because of arch support. So your body, we don't have time to get into a full biomechanics of every joint, but our arches in our foot are formed by our tarsal bones. We also have some ligaments in there. We have some fascia, plantar fascia, in there. but also our muscles play a role too. So having 
a postural medial muscle, multiple muscles that can kind of pull in a direction of inversion, actually that kind of helps recreate a movable arch. So in therapy, one of the things we try to do with people that have flat feet is kind of innervate these postural medial muscles, these inversion pullers that are on the backside to help recreate or to help uh, be, make that arch more fatigue resistant. So you see how that higher arch would be more of an inversion pull more specifically, that tibialis posterior. That tibialis posterior is a very important muscle for arch support. Another great example of origin doesn't matter. Here's a muscle that kind of has more of a lateral origin when it's out in the country. But when it comes time to cross the joint, it crosses on the inside, crosses medial. plantar flexor inverter. Guys, does that make sense how this muscle would pull in a direction of inversion? This is a right, just to make sure we're, we're understanding. This is a right leg. So this would be like if my foot was here and you'd see like the bottom of my foot. You see how that muscle would pull in a direction of... Hmm? Hmm? We had an extensor digitorum, we got a flexor digitorum. Look at this muscle crossing posterior medial and then going out to the toes. Two through five. It's much easier to see, huh? Posterior medial. And then our big toe puller, posterior medial. I like how they highlighted the color to show you. This is going to our big toe. And I'll, I just really think that's really cool. The, the muscle lives out in the country, but its influence is felt through a string that can go through the city and not take up a lot of space. I think that's really cool. Okay, so let's go back to our circles and kind of make sure we're all on the same page. To be else anterior, anteromedial, anterior dorsi flexion pull, medial inversion pull. Stensor halysis, anteromedial, same pulls. Digits and tertius, anterolateral, dorsi flexion pull, eversion pull. Our other perineal sister muscles, posterolateral, plantar flexion pull, eversion pull. Our Tom, Dick, and Harry's posterior medial, plantar flexion pull, inversion pull. Cool so far? Hey, I say them wrong all the time. Perineus, yeah. ter the tertius. Yeah. Yeah. Some people say tertius, some people say creatinine instead of creatinine. Okay, so that is. That one sits in the front of class and it sits on the outside. On the so outside. anterior outside. So it's going to be an eversion puller. Okay. And it's going to be a dorsiflexion flexion puller. So it's so this is my right. So it's going to be anterolateral. So it's going to pull in a direction of dorsiflexion mm -hmm. and it's going to pull in the direction of eversion. Okay. That this antero, so it's a dorsiflexion flexion puller and lateral. Eversion pull. I'll start trying to use my props. You just have to get mine. Okay, we're good. Okay, so now all we have to do is go over our big 
big plantar flexors. These muscles don't care about trying to balance you. They're trying to propel you. So that would be like uh, if you were riding a skateboard, you got the wobble, but you got the big powerful push, <laughs> push muscles, right, to make the skateboard go. Remember in our pulleys, the fifth class pulley, where a muscle can use another muscle to kind of help get a better angle of pull? That's what we have here. We have the soleus, or named after, I think it's Latin for soul fish, which is their version of a flounder. It's a flounder looking muscle that lives underneath the gastrocnemius. Okay. So you have the soleus, that is more what we call deep. We took out the gastrocnemius, the big calf muscle, so that you could see underneath the water and see the soleus there. The gastrocnemius gets to piggyback on top of the soleus to have a better angle of pull. Okay? So what I want, to, want you to notice, this is in the back, this is posterior. Look how straight up and down and right down the middle that pull is on the calcaneus. Again, neither medial nor lateral straight up and down. Does that make sense? It would just be posterior. Soleus and gastro. Guys, both of the, these big, powerful, propelling muscles blend into one common tendon, super famous, you've heard of it before, the Achilles. The Achilles tendon. The Achilles tendon crossing the ankle posterior, pulling up on that calcaneus, propelling you forward when you push off. Now, the gastroc does something that the soleus does not. Notice, and again, we don't have to memorize these soleal line of it. For, for this class, guys, just look at it. There's my knee joint, and the soleus doesn't cross into the knee. Only functions at the ankle. If you noticed at the first slide I gave you, gastrocnemius, biaxial, ankle plantar flexor, and knee flexor. So to have a function at the knee, that means it has to cross the knee. And if it's going to need to be a knee flexor, or a knee flexion puller, doesn't that make sense? It's, it's going to have to cross the knee in the back. It's going to have to cross the knee joint posteriorly. So let's take a look and see how that works. See how it crosses the knee posteriorly? Now, let's get into, this will be the last thing we do for the day, I think, unless y'all can, unless y'all have any follow-up questions, because I'd love to get into some practice. Why is this important? Isolation of muscles is important. Guys, when you're working your plantar flexors, yes, everybody is going to be, everybody on the team is going to get innervated. However, sometimes certain muscles contribute more or less in certain positions. I'll explain why. Think of it like this. You ever heard the term, um, you know, at work or, or at a group project, somebody's sick, somebody's not doing their job, so someone else has to take up the slack. You've heard that before. We've lived it several times. Somebody's got to take up the slack, meaning that if there's a certain amount of work to be done and there's four of you to do it and one of you isn't doing their share to get the job done, somebody's got to take up that slack. Somebody's got to do more. Okay. This is what I want to explain with the TheraBand. Okay. All muscles pull, but they also have characteristics of pull that aren't contractile. There's rubber band like properties. There's stretchy properties that we refer to as elastic properties. You have series elastic in series, and then you have 
parallel elastic. That's a fancy word of basically saying your tendon doesn't end at the muscle belly. It keeps going through the muscle belly and it reemerges on the other side. It's all part of the same inert, stretchy stuff. Where it's found, whether it's in the red muscle belly, therefore it's parallel to the contractile, or whether it's outside of the muscle belly, therefore it's in series, it's still the same stuff. Inert, do you know what inert means? That means I could zap it with electricity, it ain't doing anything. You could zap this with electricity, it's not gonna pull anymore. The only thing that's gonna affect this pull is how much I stretch it. If I make it longer, it's going to pull more. And if I make it shorter, it's going to pull less. Does that make sense? Okay. Good. Phase one complete. Now check this out. This is really cool. Your gastrocnemius crosses two joints, your ankle and your knee. So because it's a knee flexion puller, a knee flexor, when my knee is extended, that muscle has a certain amount of pull from the stretchy stuff. But when I flex my knee, it gets shorter and it pulls less on the other end. Extend the knee, pulls more. Flex the knee, pulls less because it gets put on slack. Does that make sense? If I'm doing the same work, let's say I'm doing some calf raises, with 50 pounds of force. If the gastrocnemius is on slack at the knee, meaning it's not pulling as efficiently down here, then it makes sense. Something else has to take up that slack and do more of the work. Enter soleus. <laughs> soleus isn't affected by knee position. Guys, this is why when you do exercises like seated calf raises versus standing calf raises. That's why it can isolate more of one of your plantar flexors than another. It's not that the gastrocnema shuts off. That's not what I'm saying at all. It's just kind of <clears throat> limited. It's not pulling optimally. It's not pulling at the ankle as efficiently as if it was stretched at the top, it could pull more at the bottom. Does that make sense? So when you extend the knee like a standing calf raise, that gas rock's like, dude, sweet, I can pull with more force down here. But when you flex the knee and put it more on slack, it's gonna pull less down here. And for the same amount of work, something has to take up that slack. Does that make sense? So that's why this one would emphasize the soleus and other plantar flexors because the gastrocnemius would be slacked or shortened at the knee where those others would this one the gastrocnemius would be working more because it's not slacked at the knee stretched at the knee so therefore it would pull more at the other end we're going to learn a, a few muscles like that one of them, and I love uh, life data. If you're doing leg, you know, I don't like this word, but leg extensor exercises and you're getting fatigued and you're tired, your natural instinct is to want to loom back a little bit. You get a little bit of extra pull. It's because one of those knee extensors crosses your knee in the front. It's a hip flexor. So if you're struggling, if you extend your knee, I mean your hip. Come on, Kim, you have one job. It's cool. This muscle is trying to extend your knee. If you extend your hip, you stretch it at the hip, and therefore it's going to pull more than the knee. That's what's happening there. Stretch, pull. So for the gastroc, if I flex my knee, I put it on slack, it's not going to pull more. But if I extend the knee, it's going to stretch it more at the knee, and therefore it's going to pull more at the knee. So the kind of question I would ask is, I'd give something like this, and I would say like, which ankle plantar flexor would have less of a contribution when we're doing the seed? And you'd be like, oh, that's a gastroc. Does that make sense? Like it would be that kind of question. So I want to be clear. 
when you're working your plantar flexors, it's not like these are the only two. Yes, they're the most powerful and yes, they contribute the most, but all of your plantar flexors contribute. It's just, these are, it'd be like me playing tug of war with three universal strong men and me. Am I contributing? Yeah. Am I contributing the most? No, but maybe my little pull might be enough to influence the motion. Okay. Could you ask too, so the gap shock at the bottom picture is not, um, not the primary, but not being used the most. Could you ask like vice versa and say, like on the top picture that the gap shock is? The yeah, most? the gap shock nemius would, would, would be functioning sufficiently. And I'm, I'm going to get <laughs> correct, correct. But so is the soleus. It's just that the. So it's not just, that's what I'm asking. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, 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 one, yeah. Correct. So one thing we're going to learn next class, maybe this will help us. Why this, another reason this is important. If you were going to check your hamstring flexibility, okay? Your knees are extended. For me, I don't have much flexibility. So I feel my hamstrings like after just a few degrees of flexion of my hips. I feel that stretch. But you know darn well, you can flex your hips more if you flex your knees. I go further. Because my hamstrings cross both. So if my knees are extended, I only have so much dorsi flexion because my limiting factor is going to be my gastroc. But if I put that gastroc on slack, I can have more dorsi flexion because my gastroc is not my limiting factor or my range of motion. So if I wanted to check the range of motion and check the soleus's range of motion, I'd want to slack the gastroc so that I could get further and then check the limits of my soleus. Like there's a lot of different cool things you can do by understanding lent tension. And we're going to practice. And I'm going to make sure we're clear on the types of questions I can and can't ask. And not only that, to make sure they're not ambiguous where it could be all encompassing. Okay. We're going to keep working at it. Was today useful? Is it easier to see new things now that we've seen a few of them? All right. We'll see you Wednesday. We're going to keep on this. Thank you.